Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Ross, and I am the Myron and Marion Kasdan Director and Dean's Professor of History here at USC. And on behalf of the USC Kasdan Institutes and our partners at the USC Shoah Foundation and Holocaust Museum LA, I want to welcome you all to today's event, The Legacy of Resilience, Keeping the Stories of the Holocaust Alive for the Next Generation. And this event is part of the Stronger Than Hate initiative that was organized by the USC Shoah Foundation, the USC museums, and numerous campus partners. And our mutual goal is to understand and resist hate in its many forms, be it anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Black and anti-Asian racism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, homophobia, and the many ways that people are othered. And this broad initiative involves staff and faculty, schools and centers, and of course, our students. As social media and physical spaces fill with demands for action and change, our response has been to create a robust, inclusive, cultural and academic set of programs that to provide our diverse communities with practical educational tools and resources for combating hate. Today's discussion addresses the legacy of the Holocaust and the importance of preserving memories of second and third generation trauma. Our event will feature a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Corey Street, who is the uh, Finchie uh, Viterbi Interim Executive Director of the USC Shoah Foundation. And it features five interviewees from the docu-series based project, If You Heard What I Heard, including the project's founder, Carolyn Siegel. And this series features interviews with 25 grandchildren of survivors who witnessed the pain, loss, and physical and emotional scars of the Holocaust through the stories told to them by their grandparents. And these stories range from details that were shared casually to more brutal accounts of the atrocity they had suffered during the war. And this generation, otherwise known as 3G, are the last to hear the stories of the Holocaust firsthand. If You Heard What I Heard seeks to inspire and educate future generations so that when the last survivor is gone, their memories will be preserved in perpetuity. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Corey Street. Corey has spent more than a decade leading academic, educational, and administrative initiatives that have reached scholars, educators, and students in 80 countries around the world. An historian and scholar of teaching and learning, Dr. Street oversaw the development and exponential growth of Eyewitness, the Shoah Foundation's no-cost educational platform that reaches tens of millions of educators and students worldwide. Corey has also spearheaded the Stronger Than Hate initiative, bringing the Shoah Foundation's programming and ethos to the greater USC community. A former professor at Mount Royal University, Dr. Street currently serves on the board of directors of the Association of Holocaust Organizations and is a member of the Education Working Group of the International Holocaust Alliance. It is now my great pleasure uh, to invite Dr. Corey Street to introduce today's panelists. Corey. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to you and Lisa for this wonderful um, series of programs you guys have continued to do in support of the Stronger Than Hate. Um, I'm delighted to join today for this, uh, what I think will be a very powerful program. Um, USC Shoah Foundation has the largest collection of audiovisual testimonies of survivors and witnesses to the Holocaust and other genocides. And of those, you know, 55,000 plus testimonies in the archive, more than 48,000 of them focus or about the Holocaust. And we're growing that number with our last chance collection as survivors are um, no longer able to participate and to tell their stories as we lose more and more of them. Projects like our last chance collection and what Carolyn, you've done with this project are so important to capture these stories so they can be used in perpetuity for education and research and remembrance, connecting our, our communities and ourselves um, to this powerful history. We 
Ours also are investigating how to take second and third generation uh, interviews and bring those into the collection. The second and third generation are such powerful storytellers, both for education and as a collection in itself for research. This is an important new area for those of us interested in Holocaust education and research. Carolyn, your work on capturing these powerful intergenerational stories is amazing. And I'm, I think our, our participants today on this panel um, are going to help us to understand that. And I think those of you who are signing on to this are going to see that as well. These stories have so much value as part of the process of remembrance, important in education, uh, particularly in the fight as we see the rise of identity-based hatred and anti-Semitism in particular. But they're important sources in their own right. They're stories of intergenerational trauma, intergenerational understanding, and also intergenerational resilience are so important for our understanding. So I'm looking so forward to today's dialogue with all of you. Um, and so without further comment from me, I'd like to welcome our panelists and introduce them briefly um, for those of you who don't know them yet. Lisa Ansel. Lisa, great to see you. I feel like I haven't seen you on campus now for a couple of years, but um, as the Assistant Director of USC Kazan Institute, Lisa received her BA in French and Near East Studies from UCLA, her MA in Middle East Studies from Harvard. She was the Chair of the World Language Department of New Community Jewish High School for five years before coming to USC in August of 2007. She currently teaches Hebrew language, language at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Lisa, welcome, and again, thank you for all you do for the wonderful programming. Emily Kane Miller. Emily is the founder and CEO of Ethos Giving, a social impact services forum that supports companies and families committed to moving the needle with their philanthropy and community work. Lisa launched the firm after running the wonderful company's award-winning philanthropic portfolio for almost a decade. With deep experience in government, advocacy, nonprofit, corporate, and philanthropic work, Emily has spent her career envisioning and stewarding meaningful change. As a grandchild of survivors, she feels the responsibility to tell her family's story and identified that it was harder than it should be to do so. She also knew that her family was not unique. She created Present Memory, a nonprofit endeavor to empower the families of Holocaust survivors to collect their personal stories in a compelling, easy to follow narrative using best available imagery and data. Emily has her JD from University of Arizona College of Law and her BA from UCLA. We have a lot of Bruins on this today. She and her husband, Nathan, live in Los Angeles with their two silly and awesome preschoolers. And sitting with her is her Baba Yeti, and whose story you share in this project. So I'm so glad that uh, you have joined us as well. And I'm going to check in with you to see how Emily's doing throughout the program. So I'm glad you're with us today. Also joining us today, Rabbi Jeremy Ruberk from uh, New Jersey. Uh, Jeremy currently serves as rabbi for lifelong learning, learning at Temple Emmanuel in Kloster, New Jersey. As a rabbi and grandchild of Holocaust survivors, Jeremy has committed himself to teaching the values of the Jewish people in direct response to those who wished the horrors of the Shah. An avid sports fan, he can often found either watching sports on television or working out of the gym. His wife, Rebecca, is a teen engagement consultant for the Jewish Education Project, and they are proud parents of daughter Eliza, son Jonah, and their dog Caleb. So welcome, Jeremy. We're also today joined by Dr. Ira Savetsky, who is a plastic and reconstructive surgeon joining us from Dallas, Texas. He completed his plastic and reconstructive surgery residency training program at NYU, during his training, he has worked closely with the nation's leading experts in the areas of craniofacial surgery, face transplantation, breast reconstruction, complex microvascular reconstruction, and aesthetic surgery. Dr. Svetsky completed a research fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center with a focus on tissue engineering and novel lymphedema therapies. His formal training culminated in the completion of a fellowship in aesthetic surgery of the face, nose, breast, and body at the Dallas Plastic Surgery Institute. Dr. Svetsky has published over 50 peer-reviewed publications, lectured and moderated on these topics extensively, and has been recognized for his dedication to plastic surgery with various awards, including the Snyder Award for Best Paper at the Plastic Surgery Research Council Annual Meeting and the Aesthetic Surgery Education and Research Foundation Grant. Dr. Svetsky is trained in a comprehensive range of plastic surgery procedures with a particular interest in facial rejuvenation and rhinoplasty. When he is not in the operating room, he is a staunch advocate for the Jewish people and for Israel. He enjoys spending quality time with his beautiful wife, Elizabeth, and three children, Stella, Juliet, and Ollie. 
And finally, Carolyn Siegel. Carolyn is the founder and CEO of Summer Monday, a marketing strategy consultancy based in Los Angeles, working with clients such as John Vervatos, the New York Times, Google, and many more. Prior to launching Summer Monday, Carolyn was an early employee at Gilt.com and led the West Coast events in marketing for J. Crew. Carolyn has a Bachelor of Science degree and a Master's in Business Administration from Syracuse University. She is the founder of If You Heard What I Heard. Seeing a rise in anti-Semitism in the LA area and remembering the way her Holocaust survivor grandparents recounted their stories, Carolyn launched If You Heard What I Heard as a means of making the stories of Holocaust survivors more relevant and relatable to today's generations. If You Heard What I Heard launched in April 2021 with an inaugural 15 interviewees recounting the stories of loss, pain, hope, and resilience of the Holocaust survivor generation. If You Heard What I Heard strives to keep the memories of the Holocaust alive and combat anti-Semitism through storytelling in order to drive empathy, tolerance, and acceptance for Jews and those of all faiths, races, and backgrounds so what happened during the Holocaust will never happen again. Panelists, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. We so appreciate it. Now, before we get talking to all of you and get into the, the dialogue today, I understand we have a trailer from If You Heard What I Heard, which will start to center us and give us a sense of the wonderful project that you started, Carolyn, um, and really forms the, the foundation for today. So let's watch that video. She's a badass. Like, Bubby is just like, hands down, one of the toughest, coolest, smartest people that I know. My grandfather is so cool for many reasons. Definitely his sense of humor and finding a way to make people around him laugh and, and kind of the, the, the way that he, you know, deals with his children and grandchildren in that loving, kind of free spirit kind of way. My grandmother literally was as sweet as the candy she constantly had in her pocket. She has a passion inside of her. She celebrates holidays big. She calls and sends things for every birthday. She really has a zest. SS man shot my great-grandfather in the head in front of my grandfather. When her family left Vienna, that was the last time she saw her dad. Their life changed in an instant, and it changed in the most dramatic way possible. His parents, his wife, his other siblings, his two young children, all murdered. And he left his brothers behind, and that was the last time he saw them. He and his wife, and they had a baby, and they were all killed. Uh, they felt so a part of their world, and then their worlds shut them out. They said that was the place where God did not exist. They were able to sort of, um, you know, disappear from the group quietly and not return to the ghetto one day. They rounded up all the Jews and took my grandmother holding my father. She knew that she was going to do everything possible to help keep herself and her family alive no matter what. He was smart enough to do things and sell things to keep himself going. He didn't take no for an answer. He tried to figure out a different way. And I think that was helpful in his survival. I don't think that she ever questioned whether there would be life after the war. I think she just didn't know what it was going to look like. And I think she was unwavering in her belief that she was going to make it. To try to rebuild her life and rebuild a family. You know, build a full family of life, moved on from such a horrible experience, and we're still be able to make such a great life for themselves after the fact. The fact that they didn't let all they lost stand in the way of all they could have is something that we can all draw inspiration from. Look to them for, you know, inspiration to stay resilient and remind myself that like what I'm going through is nothing compared to what they experienced. The resilience and the brilliance of those who escaped and what they did afterwards with their lives. And my poppy was so thankful for the life that he was able to create after coming from such horror. If your grandmother watched her whole family get murdered and was able to build this beautiful life. Their resilience and ability to rebuild their lives, yeah, I'm proud of them. I am the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. I am the granddaughter of one Holocaust survivor. I am the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. I'm the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. I'm the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. Tilla Paula Marie Charlotte Hepesey. That's Charles Hendlish. Esther Wasserman. Edgar Afterwood. 
Brody Glass, Hilda Zolmanovic, Andrew Stern, Albert J. Brunner, Moses Locker, Philip Inya Siegel, Dr. Rose Steingold, Frank Stern, and Magda Stern, Jlime Charlotte Lazarovic, Miriam Bell, and Joseph Huberman, Irving Mordecai Belfer, Rabbi Nissen Mengel, Nat Ross, Nathan Rosenblatt, Joseph Pitson, George Hahn, Al Kleiner, Adolf Feuerstein, Tonya Rosenblatt, Yetta Kane, The fact that I'm not ashamed to be a Jew and I'll continue to stand up for the things that he stood for and continue to stand up for what is right. When I see my daughter holding a Torah or, you know, singing a song, that was robbed from so many. And I'm not gonna let it be robbed from my kids. And we're gonna we're gonna keep it alive and we're gonna keep the traditions alive. I truly just feel like it is my duty and my obligation to tell his story because if I don't, who will? Oh, that's just wonderful, Carolyn. Thank you so much for putting that trailer together for us today. I think it's so powerful. The just the the the, the imperative to continue to tell uh, the story of um, uh, the survivors of their their grandparents and make and and sort of um, owning that in this next generation. So, Carolyn, I want to start off with you and just you know, ask you, you know, what motivated you? Like, how did you come up with this idea before we get into the kind of the, the broader, you know, topic, what inspired you to, you know, um, start if you heard what I heard and, um, and, uh, and, and maybe you can say a little bit about how you identified and selected the interviewees um, uh, and what perspectives they brought. Yeah, well, first, I just want to say thank you so much for having us here today. It's a real honor to be here with you. And um, to highlight if you heard what I heard alongside the USC Shoah Foundation. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so as you mentioned, I, you know, I'm from LA, born and raised in LA. And in May of 2020, I noticed a very steep rise of anti-Semitism. Um, specifically, there were a number of protests happening in LA at that time, and a synagogue was graffiti. And I remember thinking, what, this is like the fifth or sixth incident just this year, where there's some sort of anti-Semitic attack. Turns out it was one of over 2,000 anti-Semitic attacks across the country um, for 2020 alone. And since then, we've obviously seen a very sharp rise in anti-Semitism beyond, well beyond that. So at the time, I remember thinking, you know, why are these anti-Semitic attacks happening? When I was growing up in LA, there just seemed to be more empathy out there. And these attacks were not as frequent. Um, so I thought about my grandparents who survived the Holocaust, and I was looking through some family photos and actually found um, a photo of my great-grandparents who were killed in the Holocaust. Grandparents that my mom never got to have, but whose stories I heard throughout my life. And I remember thinking, you know, how sad it is that my kids will never get to hear the stories that I heard over the course of decades of my life firsthand. And... I thought about the tools that exist for today and I actually thought about the Shoah Foundation and how incredible, you know, the archive is and thank God we have that for all time. But, you know, I thought about maybe there's something missing for today. Is somebody really going to sit down and watch a two plus hour interview that was filmed 25 years ago? You know, so while the, the Shoah Foundation archives are amazing and incredible and are something that I wish everyone would, you know, dive into and watch. I was thinking about, well, is there a way in? Is there a gateway in? Is there something that we can do to make these stories more relatable? Maybe if you heard the story from somebody like me in a shorter time frame, within, you know, 15 to 30 minutes, maybe that would pique your interest to, to go watch a show, a foundation interview and really learn more. So that was really sort of the impetus for this project is how can we make these stories more relatable for today? And, you know, if you heard what I heard, you would never forget. If you heard what I heard, you would do everything possible to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, so that's really how the project started. And um, I've been very lucky to have this incredible group of interviewees that I think have really made the project their own and all, you know, feel very passionately about telling their grandparents' stories so that it doesn't die out and it lives forever. Um, 
So to answer your question, Corey, about how how the selection process has gone with you know finding the interviewees, um, when I first set out on this journey in May of 2020, I don't have a film background. I'm a marketer, so I'm a storyteller by nature, but I sort of didn't know where to start. Um, growing up in LA in the Jewish community, I knew that I knew other people like me, grandkids like me who had Holocaust survivor grandparents. So I turned to social media. I put up a post on Facebook and within 24 hours, I had 12 responses within just my friend group. Um, and Jeremy was one of those responses um, that you know raised his hand and said, I'm the grandchild of survivors. And Aaron Aftergood, whose um, clip we're gonna see a little bit later, he was actually the very first person that, that got in touch and said, I'm the grandchild of survivors. And um, again, not having a background in film, I did five test round interviews and Jeremy, Aaron, and Melissa were part of that um, first five test round interviews to sort of say like, is, is there something here? You know, can I make something of this? Is this viable? And within those five test round interviews, actually Jeremy's was the first interview that we shot the test round interview and it was so powerful and compelling. Um, that it really, you know, inspired me. And, you know, I sort of said, I've got to do this. Their stories are too important. Um, and Lisa, you know, thankfully was also part of the first round of filming. And since then, you know, I've just, last week we just released 10 new interviews. Ira and Emily are part of that. And it's such a joy to see the project continue to grow. And what a difference these stories make for the families of survivors, but also beyond that, just within each of our friend groups and each of our networks, you know, to, to fan out and sort of share these stories far and wide. Friends of ours who may not be Jewish and had no idea that, you know, we all have Holocaust within our legacy, within our lineage. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of the project and I'm incredibly proud of the interviewees and very grateful for them. I understand um, that of your 25 interviewees, of all of their grandparents that they talk about, their stories that they share, we we only have six still with us. Is that correct? Yeah, there are six grandparents still with us. Mm -hmm. So honored that Bobby Yetta is here with us today. Such a blessing. Um, Jeremy's grandfather, Papa Albert, is, is, thank God, still with us. And may he continue to be for many more years in good health. Um, Rhody Glass, who Danielle Robay's grandmother, Rhody Glass, actually speaks every week at the um, Chicago Holocaust Museum in Illinois, which is incredible. And we have uh, Regina Kleiner, Jennifer Rosenblatt's um, grandmother is still with us. And gosh, I, you're like testing me now. I'm trying to think of who. <laughs> but we're very, very blessed to have, you know, have the grandparents that are here with us, you know, um, engaged and, and mm. I, I, Emily can speak to this more, I think than I can, but I, mm. I know that the, um, what the feedback that I've gotten from a lot of the grandparents who have seen our work is that they're just very grateful and very proud. And honestly, I, I've said that there, are, I actually texted Emily with this the other day. There are three things that I care about more than anything. One is that the interviewees are happy with their interview and happy with how, you know, how they're telling the story. Um, two, that the younger generation can relate to it. And three, and this is probably the most important one for me as the grandchild of, of Holocaust survivors, is that our grandparents, and more than anything, you know, the families that were lost, that they're looking down from wherever they are and that they're proud. So to have survivors here living and make them proud mission accomplished. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, we really are at one minute to midnight to capture um, any more of these stories. So throughout this, I'll probably be plugging our last chance testimony collection so we can get more of these stories um, in the archive. But panelists, I want to turn to you. So impressed in, um, reading your biographies and the honor to introduce you all with how much you're doing, how much advocacy, how much community work, how much you're giving back. And I wonder how the grandchild, being the grandchild of a Holocaust survivor influences your level of community 
community engagement, your philanthropy, your advocacy, your participation, um, whether related to the Holocaust or otherwise. So, you know, um, Lisa, let's start with you. I'm just going to kind of go around and I want to hear from each of you on this question. So how does it influence you to, to be the grandchild of survivors? Hi, Tori. Uh, thank you so much for the honor of being here as well. And I just want to mention on the outset that yesterday was my Bobby's first year at site. And so I am dedicating my participation on this panel to her, to her memory, Hilda Zalmanovitz. Um, being the granddaughter of two survivors, for me, it has always been a clear mission to continue to support Holocaust education and to vocally advocate for, um, I'd say, education against anti-Semitism in any form, not even broad enough, just any anti-racism, anti-bigotry in any form, um, as a grandchild of genocide survivors. For me, it is a mission to actively support organizations and endeavors to um, to really, really support any sort of action against racism and bigotry that we see in our society. Great. Jeremy, what about you? You know, it's weird for me because I made the decision many years ago to dedicate my life uh, to cause of the Jewish people, uh, going to Jewish education, getting a master's at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and also getting my rabbinical degree. So I knew I always wanted to do something with being a part of the Jewish people and educating others. Uh, but to be honest, I think I was a bit, I felt a bit of a backlash against the the world I grew up in where we just talked about the Holocaust a lot. It wasn't every day, uh, but my parents uh, were, my mother is the first gen, second generation, both my grandparents, her parents were Holocaust survivors. And I was used to just a lot of Shoah conversation and um, messages. And I think I was part of the generation for a while that felt that everyone had a relative who was in the Shoah and everyone knew about it. And to be honest, it was, after Carolyn got in touch with me, I'll, I'll be honest, it was recent that it, it hit me how few survivors we know are still alive, and it became more of a cause for me. I'll be honest, Carolyn, you really woke that up in me, and I think you woke that up in a lot of us. Um, and it's a testament to her hard work and illustrating the need for us to highlight how few survivors there are left and that we are their mouthpiece. And it's not just sharing their stories, it's also sharing the impact it had on us and the impact it can have on the next generation. And don't assume that every grandkid knows about their grandparents or great grandkids. I'll just share a quick anecdote. So I work here at a very large conservative synagogue here in Closter, New Jersey. I have a seventh grade class. I had 20 kids the other day come to hear from the grandchild of a survivor. And I asked how many of you have survivors in your family. And about 10 of them raised their hand saying that they had, and the other one said they didn't. Whether that's true or not, it's a different conversation. And of that 10, I asked how many are still alive, and they, two of them raised their hand. And the truth is, I asked how many of you heard from them firsthand, and one of them had. That means that there are very few of us who can share firsthand what we heard, and we are the first line of defense against those who are not just deniers, but those who also distort. We heard it. We know it happened and we trust the source. And in the world we live in of media distortion and a lack of good information, we are the source of good information and we will be that first line. So for me, um, it wasn't growing up, it was recent. And uh, I've dedicated myself to this project and it, a lot of it's thanks to Carolyn and others like her. Wow, amazing, thank you. Ira, What what is it about being a grandchild of a Holocaust survivor and how has it influenced the work that you do as an advocate say? Well, first off, thank you for having me here today uh, among such a great group of panelists. And, um, you know, similarly, I grew up um, going to a Jewish day school where I was uh, essentially one of many who had uh, survivors in their family and, and really wasn't a, a novelty. So uh, I didn't really think much of it because, you know, everyone around me, um, his grandparents for the most part, uh, was in the Holocaust. Uh, but as I moved through life and going through college and then medical school, 
um, where you really are um, unique, uh, I, I, I did sort of feel the responsibility to uh, talk about it and speak about it. And I think over the past few years with uh, anti-Semitism on the rise, I really felt uh, the need to really educate um, people who uh, are not so familiar with it. And, and I think we all have responsibility uh, because never again really means never again. And never again means educating um, uh, our peers and others who are willing to listen. So, um, you know, these days with social media and again, and as mentioned, misinformation is rampant. Um, anyone, whether you have, you know, five followers or 5 million followers has a responsibility to use their voice and to educate. No, exactly. Such great advice. Emily, same question to you. Yeah. So, you know, for us, um, it was actually my grandparents doing tapes with Shoah in the 1990s that I think inspired them to tell us, their grandkids, and also my parents' generation more about their experiences. Um, and at that time, you know, I was 10, 11, 12. So this has really been part of our family narrative and our understanding of who we were um, from very early on. And it was really woven together, certainly the seriousness and tragedy, um, but also the responsibility and the opportunity that we really were all miracles, um, all of us who, who came from them and, and their friends and other survivor grandchildren, and that you had an opportunity and a responsibility to do something really special with your life. You know, a second here, a minute there, one other person's different decision. Um, and, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be where we are. And so, um, you know, that's really helped me establish a life where I've focused on public policy um, and philanthropy and corporate philanthropy and helping people steward resources to do good better. Um, a big part of the way that I spend my time is working with Jewish leaders um, and people with resources to raise up opportunities for the Jewish community, including Holocaust education, but also Jewish education, summer camp, Jewish day school, helping to make sure those resources are sustained for generations to come. Um, and I definitely do that work with a sense of love and a sense of responsibility because of who I am and where I came from and uh, because of my Bubby and Zadie. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have your Bubby's um, uh, VHA, te your testimony in the Visual History Archive, and she doesn't look a day older than she gave it to us like 20 odd years ago. So, um, but I, I'm wondering, were you in the photograph? Because one of the things in those um, uh, interviews is we often ask the survivors to bring in their families and, and many of the families have, you know, um, at the end of the interview, they talk about, just as you said, like the importance of the family, the importance of carrying it on. Were you in that photo on the, in the archive? I am. And it's interesting. Oh. I watched the archive as part of a project that I've been working on called present memory, which show has been so generous to share, um, the resources and tapes for, and there's a photo of my Bubby introducing us. And my son is interchangeable with me. Like when they said, this is Emily, um, mm -hmm. and a picture of her when she was a baby, I was like, that's Judah. That's not me. Um, so it, it really did strike home. Um, just the importance of memory, the importance of, of the work that was established in the 1990s and also carrying it on today with our own voices and our, in our own time. Amazing. Carolyn, do you have anything to add on this? I know part of, you know, what's motivated you is, is to do this project that we're talking about, but more generally, how does, you know, how does this impact your, you know, the choices you've made as, as you've um, become an adult and now in adulthood? Yeah, I think there are a few things that influence um, just how I move through life and how I support various causes and the sense of giving back. One, from a Jewish perspective, um, my grandmother, who's, I shared my grandfather's story for if you heard what I heard, but my grandmother um, was sort of forced to hide during the war and she had to hide her faith. She pretended to be Catholic during the war. Mm -hmm. And I, there's a very big sense for me of because she had to hide her faith, I take every opportunity to celebrate mine. And so any opportunity to be Jewish, celebrate Judaism, support Jewish causes comes from that. And then the other part of that, you know, growing up, going to Jewish schools my whole life, 
I graduated from Milken Community High School at a time when Dr. Bruce Powell was our, the headmaster of that school. And Milken's ethos, I think it still is, is very much rooted in um, tikkun olam and making the world a better place. And so I think for me, I sort of blended being the grandchild of, a hol of Holocaust survivors with a sense and sort of how I grew up around tikkun olam and how can I give back. So I think for me, they're sort of one in the, in the same. Um, I think, you know, both having sort of grown up under Dr. Powell and with Holocaust survivor grandparents has shaped how I look at wanting to make the world a better place, celebrate Judaism and, and having that value set within me. It's amazing. We did some work uh, a number of years ago with Milken on a, a project, as you describe, and um, wonderful, wonderful um, program. Um, so we're about we're going to change gears and talk about specific stories here in a second. But I love I think it was Jeremy who talked about the importance of going to the source. So we're going to going to look at a testimony from Esther Wasserman and then hear from um, um, Esther's uh, granddaughter. Um, Esther is a testimony that we recorded here in Los Angeles in 1995. Um, uh, she comes from Poland. She survived uh, experiences in the ghetto, um, in camps, including in Ravensbrück. Um, she survived a death march. And in this story, she talks about resilience, about, you know, you know, doing whatever you can to stand up and, um, and to not, not to give in to, you know, some pretty horrible. So let's play that video before we talk about um, more of the stories that have inspired us. I took sick and I was very sick with a high fever. I didn't want to stay in the barracks. Because a lot of girls that didn't go to work, they took them out. If you didn't go, if you stay, didn't go to work, they got a different place where they ship you in, and then then they 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 they, they got a place to kill you. So I said, well, to be killed or be dead, maybe when I walk with everybody, it's better. A lot of girls help. They helped me, and I went through through the gate, the assessment. A lot of used to stay and look. Sometimes he took out somebody, a few times. He just made with his finger. If you, if you are young, he took you out, he rapes you, whatever. He, ki and he killed you, you know. If you are old, he, do he doesn't eat you. If you are sick, he doesn't eat you. Why should he give you a little soup? So when I walked by through, I got my head up and I, was, I couldn't. So the girls hold me, you know, like we did go six. You know, six together, so they hold me like under my arms to go through. Was uh, was uh, oh, was so far rough. You know, I'm always so inspired by these stories of you know, particularly when you're feeling a little bit down and everything. That you know, here she is, like finding a way to go to work with the help of you know um, uh, others um, when she has typhus. Like, I mean, I just, I think of these things and you all must have stories that your grandparents have told you that inspired you or, or impacted you. So I'd love to hear like if there's one story or, or some stories that really um, inspired you, um, affected you in, in that kind of way. Um, Ira, let's start with you. Was there a particular story that really you know, changed, impacted you when you were growing up or a particular story from your grandparents? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously so many, but, you know, one that sort of resonates today is that um, uh, from my great uncle, um, you know, his best friend throughout school, um, lower school, middle school, um, really his best, best friend, um, you know, all of a sudden one day when, he came over to play some ball with him. He saw um, uh, a soldier that was in his best friend's house who was not Jewish. And um, his best friend basically came out and said, you know, I can no longer be friends with you. I can never see you again because um, you're Jewish. And, um, you know, hearing that as, um, as a child to hear basically your best friend just dump you for one reason only, I think really, really hit me at that time. Um, Cause that's something that I could never have imagined when I was a child. Oh, that was so powerful. Carolyn, how about you? Is there one story that really resonated with you? Yeah, I think like Ira, it's always hard to just pin one because you hear all these stories throughout your life and they impact you in different ways. I think 
a story that I thought of recently. Uh, my grandfather was the only surviving member of his family. And uh, really interesting, we actually just connected with family uh, that we weren't in touch with, didn't really know about. We just connected with them. My grandfather was in Berlin before the war. He was from Poland, but he was in Berlin studying to become a lawyer and he was staying with a cousin. So we just recently connected with this cousin's family, but um, he and, and his cousin saw Hitler speak. And I remember my grandfather telling me how jarring that was for him to hear Hitler speak because there was so much hate. And he said, and Ira even says it in his interview that Hitler's voice was like a monster. And when Ira said that, I was like, you know, my grandfather said the same thing that, that there was something about Hitler's voice that just like shook him to his core. And he went back home and said to his family, we need to leave. We need to get out of here. And his family didn't want to listen. And ultimately they were all killed in the Holocaust. But, you know, I think about that story recently. Um, and today, especially with the rise of anti-Semitism and looking at warning signs. And I think my whole life, you know, I've always sort of been like, what are the warning signs? How are we going to know when it's time to get out? Um, so it's something that I think about and I've thought about a lot more recently. Oh, that's amazing. Jeremy, any stories that stand out for you? Yeah, there's one particular story that has always stuck with me. And I think it's important to mention, you know, everyone's story of their parents or grandparents that went through the Shoah are very different. And as I mentioned in my testimony, I'm very blessed. My grandfather was able to escape on the kinder transport, the trains that got the children out of Germany and ultimately made his way to England. And in fact, I found his ship manifests and it's been a fantastic journey uh, with my grandfather actually finding documents. Um, and that's brought it to life. And it's actually a story from his time in the DB camps, because we forget, you know, the period of the Shoah isn't just God forbid those who went to death camps or death marches. It's those who are going through this period of ongoing persecution and the fear. So there, the story goes, my grandfather tells me that he was a part of a Zionist youth organization. To this day, I, I still haven't gotten out of him the name of it. I'd love to know. And he tells me that they were given very little food by the British government. And at the time, it must have been Shabbat or a holiday. And after they were done, the head of the organization said, OK, boys, it's time for you to say Bir Katamazon, the grace after meals. And my grandfather and a bunch of boys stood up and said, we will not do that. As the Bible says, you will eat, you will be satisfied and you will bless. And he will say, we were not satisfied and we will not bless. And we will continue to eat only in order for us to be strong enough. But we will thank God when this is over. And to be honest, that was something that shook me, and it shook me twofold. One, that the pain that they went through, what is it like to be that hungry all the time, that you would say that you can't eat enough, that you're not going to say thank you for your food. And the second, that, to be honest, uh, my grandfather was a pretty you know, knowledgeable, religious, observant man, would say, I'm not going to follow this religious precept, not now and not until later. And now he says his great graces and thanks for where he is now. But what a difficult time that was for him. And in our family where food, like a lot of Jewish families, is very, very important. And another time we talk about how food and Holocaust survivor families played out. Um you know, that he didn't have enough. Uh, it struck me tremendously. And to this day, I, I quote it all the time and it affects me. I, I never waste anything on my plate. And that goes back to years of eating in my grandparents' home. My grandmother, you had food, you could take as much as you want, but you're going to eat all of it. That mm -hmm. is something that we learned. Food is important. It's a gift from God. And we say thank you for what we get. Oh, that's amazing. Emily, what about you? Is there any particular story that resonates with you? And, and if your um, uh, Bubby wants to share a story that she thinks should resonate with you, I'd also welcome uh, um, her to do that. But what story stands out for you? So she, she already whispered to me what I should share. So I'm going to share what, I'm, <laughs> what she suggested. Um, yeah, I could say something too. Okay. All right, so, you know, the story that I shared with, if you heard what I heard was my, my Bubby and her family's story, but the story I want to share right now is about my Zeta. He, um, survivor of Buchenwald. it was a survivor of Buchenwald. Um, and he and his father were the only ones to survive from his entire family. They were alone. They had, um, seen just terrible, terrible tragedy, um, at the point when they got to Buchenwald and still he had this 
desire to live. Um, and he was blessed with a beautiful voice, a beautiful singing voice, and he was amazing with languages. And so one of the things that the guards noticed was that he was really good with singing and they essentially had him as the after dinner entertainment and he could sing little ditties in, um, in German for them. And he did it with a smile. And I can't imagine, you know, sort of speaking to what Jeremy was just saying, there's no way that he was actually happy. There's no way that going into those rooms, he was comfortable and he pretended and he put on a show um, because he knew that it would help him see another day. And just the level of perseverance and grit and um, hopefulness that, that that, you know, meant he had as a 11, 12, 13 year old boy was something that as a person that age, I could never imagine being in his shoes. Um, and it also helped me to understand knowing him later in his life, in his sixties and seventies and eighties, you still saw that in him. He was always with a joke, always with a smile, always offering somebody, um, you know, a, a positive comment. And it's something that I've always admired and really try to bring into the way that I live in the world. Oh, that's beautiful. Did your um, Bubby want to add any another story or um, a particular story that has impact? I could speak for five hours without a stop, but I'll make it big it's or short. Yeah. Life was hell, now I'm in heaven. And mm -hmm. I was blessed with loving parents who believed in God, believed in a better tomorrow. Can you imagine an eight-year-old being hungry, being cold, being shot at, being chased, crossing railroads, running away, Part bars in bodies, German, Russian soldiers. We had to cross rivers, put us on a rowboat. I didn't know if I'd ever see my parents again or not. We, if we're lucky enough, we met them down the stream in three hours. But it was, we had, we were tachat kanfei hashchina. We were beneath God's wings that he protected us. The reason I survived, and I think the reason I survived is to have a Dor Hadash, a new generation of Jewish children like my granddaughter, Emily, who believe in Yehadut in Yiddishkeit, who believed in better tomorrow, who believed in helping, helping other people, who believe in humanity, in kindness, in love, and we go Kadima. The Amaleks, everybody, the Hitlers tried to destroy us, but we're here and we'll always be here no matter how many reds come from under the woodwork. So I would say, I'm Israel Chai, may the Jewish people live. What helped me and my parents is speaking different languages. At home was Yiddish or Hebrew, and the outside, whether it was Slavic, whether it's Polish, Russian, I happened to speak Russian, Polish, German, Spanish, Jewish, and Hebrew, and of course, Yiddish. And so it helped me in my life. And Torah, Torah, Torah is knowledge. Mm. When we ran away from home, we could take nothing. But the Torah that we had and the wisdom and portable wealth that would sustain us from surviving another day. So I want to thank you for listening to me and for being able to tell this story. And I'm blessed. I have nine great grandchildren. And there was a day when I was eight, day, eight years old, I didn't think I'd make it to another day. So that's why the reason I speak. In USC, I speak before high schools. I speak in churches, whoever listens to me. And so I'm in demand, I guess, because the price is right. Well, thank you. I'm thank so you. glad you honored and shared your story story with us. Um, Lisa, what story do you have that uh, you remember? I know it's hard to follow. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to follow Bobby yet over here. What an inspiration you are. Amen, amen to everything that you just said. Um, I think the way I'm going to answer this question is to talk about my Bobby's resilience as opposed to one particular story. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmother was the sole survivor of her entire family. So she lost her parents and her younger sister in Auschwitz. And my grandmother survived and was left in a displaced persons camp in Munich, Germany, where she met my grandfather and then subsequently married him and then had my mother uh, in Germany. My mother was born in a displaced persons camp in Munich. And then shortly after they moved from Germany to the United States. 
and the resilience that my grandmother had to go literally from the frying pan into the fire, a brand new country with a language she didn't speak, having to all of a sudden earn money, having to navigate a whole new system of cultural norms and a culture that she was so unfamiliar with. Um, she had tremendous common sense. And although she was deprived of the opportunity to have a formal education, um, she was really brilliant. She was so insightful. And I would say one of the lessons she gave me was that she told me when she came to this country, she came with one dollar that she kept her entire life. Mm -hmm. And she taught us the importance of living within your means and always saving for a better tomorrow. You know, my grandmother lived in New York. They first came to New York on the proverbial boat. They lived in Rhode Island where my aunt was born. They lived in Connecticut where they had a farm. And ultimately they came to California where my grandfather was a chauffeur, a kosher butcher. And they literally started from scratch everywhere they went. And they used their tremendous secha, the tremendous um, knowledge and wisdom, and I would say old fashioned common sense to build on the Jewish traditions that they brought with them, even though they didn't have their the familial support. They didn't have any structural support anywhere they went. They were both the sole survivors of their entire families. But the level of resilience that they had instilled within my mom, my aunt, and my uncle, and then subsequently to my brother and myself, is something that I'll always carry with me in my heart. And it is a driving force behind my career and my social activism as well. Oh. And that's a, a you know amazing. I think that the as um, Esther Washman talked about that resilience um, as well. Um, now we're going to hear from um, her granddaughter, Melissa, uh, what was part of the, um, uh, if you heard what I heard, um, uh, group to see what she took away from stories from um, Esther uh, survival and how that impacted her today. And I think you're going to see a lot of the commonalities we've got across all of our panelists. So let's play that video. And she contracted typhus at that time in that first camp. And um, she described, you know, knowing that you can't stop working. If you stay in the barracks because you're sick or you're not feeling well, they take you um, to the place that you don't want to go. And so she described um, when it was time to wake up and go to work that she had two women holding her up by each of her arms uh, and basically carrying her um, to the roll call for that day. I get this vivid image of like, you know, being lifted up, empowered by other women, literally that are helping you live and survive day to day because without them, she likely would not have been strong enough to stand up on her own. Oh, see, it's so amazing. And that common feature in the stories that inspired all of you to be resilient, to stand up, to speak out. Um, and I loved um, that that concept of they can't take away what's in your head and that, um, you know, that that need to get up. Those resonate with with young people today. They re they resonate with, um, you know, the not so young people today. When we talk about these and we have them listen to the testimonies, um, those stories will will always be available. But you can see that that, that, um, that drive to be resilient um, that was so present and what that means today. And I think um, Jonah Gold, Goldrich, who's also um, very um, central to the Holocaust Museum LA, as well as to us, um, uh, talked about that, you know, importance of holding on to what's in your heart and what's in your head, because, you know, um, people who hate can take away or try to take away so many other things, but they can't take away that, you know, who you are and that what's in your head. Um, and so we, I think we've heard from you in terms of, you know, the life lessons that were really powerful that your grandparents stories really drove you to. Um, I'd like to go to another um, a clip in this case, um, Edgar Aftergood, um, um, who, again, I uh, recorded here in the mid 90s in Los Angeles who came from Berlin, but concealed his identity, had to hide. And that's a very, um, uh, you know, something that um, was was very common for many people that um, we've even already raised, but is already is happening 
you know, every day for lots of young people um, in Los Angeles who feel that they have to conceal their identity, hide, and and the the damage of, that that can do. And so he's gonna he talks about his lack of optimism, particularly when he's seen in 1994 a rise in anti-Semitism, a rise in hate. So let's um, cue that um, clip from Edgar Aftergood. My personal feeling is that uh, I really cannot be very optimistic as far as the world in general is concerned. Because if after this outrage that happened, if after all this, this whole thing can restart again with this anti-Semitism and, and killing of Jews, and what is even worse, this denial that this ever happened, and, and that people actually, there are people who believe this, that this is all an exaggeration. If, if this could happen, then there's something very, very wrong. You see, I gave a talk one time about the Warsaw Ghetto to a group of young students. When I was finished, they asked me, how do you feel today? Do you feel secure? Do you feel that the worst is over? And I told them, I'm sorry to say it, but I don't. I don't feel secure. Yeah. So there we have an, an example of when, you know, the story, and, and some of you have already kind of raised the specter of, you know, the rising anti-Semitism, the rising tide of hate that we're all experiencing. So in that context, how important it is that for you to continue the legacy of your grandparents and their story? And what kinds of challenges are you, you know, running into? And, and how are you feeling about the impact that this can have and, um, and, and the, the warning signs that we're seeing now. Um, Carolyn, let's start with you on this one. Sure. Um, you know, so one of, the, one of the ways I really wanted to approach, if you heard what I heard, is not with this sort of like heavy hitting, you have to hear this story, textbook education way in. It's really meant to be like, hey, come sit down, grab a coffee, sit down with me, hear my story. Did you know that my grandfather went through this whole experience? It's really meant to be that because I, my personal feeling is that if we can relate these stories in a softer way and not to say that there's not room for the more hard hitting, you know, the textbook education or some of the other, you know, programs and resources out there, but this particular project is focused on a softer way in and a softer approach to help combat that denial and combat that anti-Semitism, because if we can make it more relatable and make it mm -hmm. more approachable, the hope is that, um, that we won't see this rise of anti-Semitism because I want everyone watching these stories to feel like they can make it their own. Um, we have a family friend in Connecticut. They're not Jewish. And when their daughter was 10, she was reading number of the stars. And she called me and said, Carolyn, what do you know about the Holocaust? And I was like, well, how much time do you have? But it was, you know, 10 30 at night on a school night. And I, you know, what do you tell a 10 year old at that time? And, and I told her my grandmother's story, which was sort of, again, like this, a little bit of a softer approach in, in kind of the same way that I was told the story when I was eight years old, when I was 10 years old and, um, sort of taking that approach. I mean, Haley, you know, like I said, she's not Jewish, but she's in college now and recently had a conversation with a friend of hers who, um, who had family, I think that, you know, was part of the Nazi party and Haley made my story, her story. And this is someone again, who's not Jewish, who feels like the story is hers and can speak to, Hey, this really happened because my friend's family went through this. Um, so I, you know, I think for me, that's, that's a very big piece of sort of, you know, combat combating anti-Semitism, combating denial is through this softer approach. But I think we need, it needs to be hand in hand. It needs to be all of us working together um, as a society to make sure that we never forget. Lisa, how about you? Well, you know, there's that famous quote from Mr. Rogers, you know, when he says, when you see something scary on the news, look for the helpers. And that really resonates with me because when we see any act of discrimination, any act of violence against any persecuted minority, we want to first look to see who is speaking out 
against these atrocities and to, to band together and to show our support and our solidarity in action and not just words with um, any sort of public demonstration that is unacceptable and um, counter to our values. Ira? Yeah, I think um, things are increasingly becoming a little bit more complicated in some ways because you could take a poll of you know people from all over about whether or not they are could they denounce anti-Semitism because I think most rational and educated people uh, will stand up against it. But where things get complicated and what we're seeing nowadays more so is the tie between Zionism or anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. And I think not only do we have the responsibility to talk about uh, to denounce anti-Semitism, but also to denounce falsehoods and misinformation with regards to the state of Israel. Because I think people feel that um, they could be uh, against the state of Israel without being against uh, Jews. And, you know, I think pretty much every Jew is a Zionist. We all agree in some capacity the need for the Jews to have our own country and our own state. So to say I'm an anti-Zionist, uh, but I still believe in um, uh, Jewish rights and livelihood, I think we're entering uh, sort of uncharted territory in, in a lot of ways. And we're, we have a, a, a sort of large battle out there that we need to fight. Oh, too true. Emily? So obviously, I think all of us believe it's critical um, to share these stories. One of the things that I always admired growing up was that my grandparents made it a point to have uh, talks that they gave at schools across Southern California. And one of the things that my brothers and I and my cousins and I have been talking about is like that that's now our responsibility and that we need to go into public schools, um, especially places that probably don't know Jewish families and certainly haven't met survivors to carry the story. And one of the things that I'm so grateful for, you know, with, if you heard what I heard and what Carolyn's building and what we're trying to do with present memory is making it easier and more approachable for people, you know, three G's and others who want to carry on these stories to feel like they have uh, a kit that, you know, they can, they can pick up the conversation and get started. They don't have to start from scratch. Um, there's, such a daunting feeling. We, most of us don't have photos. We don't have um, a lot of the documentation in place because of the harried past of our families coming over as refugees and all of these memories being destroyed. And so if through Shoah, through present memory, through if you heard, somebody feels like there's a lower barrier for entry, they can tell these stories more easily. I think that's something that we can all work on. And, and what I hope projects like this remind people um, who are listening that that this is not that hard and that they can go into their local public school um, and carry these stories forward and that it's something that we all really need them to do. Jeremy, what about you? How do you think about this in this time of rising anti-Semitism, particularly when you're leading a congregation? I think the problem and challenge is that the perception of what anti-Semitism is, uh, is very different also amongst generations. Uh, how Gen Z says anti-Semitism and certain events is different than how millennials, as well as those previous to them, see what anti-Semitism is, what is considered a Jewish problem as opposed to a universal issue. And so rather than try to parse them out and try to convince them what it is and what it isn't, let's give them the information for them to make that decision themselves, empower them with the stories that we know that they never got to hear, have it shared in a way that they can access, such as what, if you heard what I heard is doing, which is in shorter clips and accessible Instagram methods that they can relate to. Look, I enjoyed very much the clips we saw, but I can tell you that uh, my daughter will not understand why the video was so grainy a few minutes ago, right? They want high definition. They know things that are crisper, cleaner, and not old. And, and unfortunately, that's a reality. And so I think that's a big part of it. And I think it's up to us also to take that information, give it to the next generation, and then help us 
the next generation also to also ritualize how do we remember those events. So I'll make it a quick example without making it too rabbinic. Uh, we right now do not have much other than Yom HaShoah. Right, there's Yom HaShoah, but what do we do on Yom HaShoah? We commemorate, we light candles, we talk, but there's nothing to really grab onto. There's no Seder, there's no lighting uh, candle, there's no anything. Uh, I think we have to move past that. We have to move into the next stage of Jewish observance. Perhaps it becomes the next fast day. Perhaps it becomes a day of synagogue attendance. Otherwise, if we don't tell the stories, we will never ritualize and we'll never see it remembered. That's what the rabbis did years ago with the temple destruction. Now we have five fast days around that, and that was 2,000 years ago. This is 100 years ago, not even, and we have very little. I think we need to take this information, ritualize it, and make it more a part of Jewish life regularly, not just once. I, I just want to add on to that. You know, this we launched, if you heard what I heard, in April of 2021. And we launched a day before Yom HaShoah. We were actually supposed to launch on Yom HaShoah. But when Jeremy just said what he said, and he and I had this conversation um, when we were right around the time we were filming his interview, and he said, you know, I really take Yom HaShoah seriously. And I really, you know, make it a day um, that I reflect on, on what happened and the families that were lost and what happened to our people. And when he said that, I said, okay, I'm moving the launch date a day up so that we can honor Yom HaShoah and keep it sacred. And that's credit to Jeremy. So thank you, Jeremy, for, for doing that. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great reminder. And I'm, I'm um, so heartened by your optimism because we often, you know, it's so easy sometimes to slide into um, despair when it seems like the tide is against us. So the, the power of these stories and, and to continue remarkable optimism. And Jeremy, I'll take your, your thoughts in. I have a, a meeting tomorrow on the International Survivors Day, which is something that's in, happening in June now. Um, and to really look at, we were, we've been talking a lot about how do we honor um, the you know, these um, individuals really well. But I'd like to turn to hear how Aaron Aftergood, another participant in this wonderful project, reflects on how what what he learned from Edgar um, as a mentor and as, um, you know, someone and, and the impact on his life today. So let's play the Aaron Aftergood video and then um, come back to the It'll be important for my kids and my grandkids, uh, hopefully sometime in the future, to, uh, to remember that there was a member of their family and a member of their people not so many generations back who uh, really uh, suffered, suffered a terrible loss of nearly his entire family and everything he had grown up with. And uh, yet he was able to, to start anew uh, from nothing, um, build a family, build a career, build a community, uh, and build a life. Oh, that's amazing. So I know we're, we're bringing the, um, uh, the panel uh, to a close and we want to encourage those of you who are watching to put your questions in the um, Q&A so the panelists have a chance to look at those. But I'd like to ask each of you to think about, you know, kind of one message, like if this is your chance to share in terms of the, you know, the, the legacy for this, um, you know, and the kind of the, you know, the, the, that one, you know, um, bon mot of the life lesson, um, or your hope for the future of this project or this kind of work that you're doing, but what's that, that one thing that, um, uh, uh Virginia Woolf used to talk about how important it was to like write our ideas up and it's like wrapping up a, a present that you're going to take for later. So what's that one thing you want people to take away from what you're doing, what you've learned from your grandparents, um, and what you've, you've learned about yourself and them and the importance of acting and standing up um, from this project. So I'm going to let you self-identify who wants to go first with that. One last word. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I think if, if I could like identify one thing that I want anyone watching our stories to take away is that and a lot of us say it in our interviews that it's so important to know that this happened so that it doesn't happen again, but that it doesn't happen again to any group. And we see other genocides and we see so much hate out there. And I think one of the things that I've noticed about grandchildren, children of Holocaust survivors within the, the family is 
there's so much compassion that comes from knowing Holocaust story, especially if you have it in your family. But um, I think there have been studies that have shown that Holocaust education, you know, directly results in um, empathy, tolerance, compassion. So I think my biggest thing is I want anyone watching, if you heard what I heard, to walk away with a little, a little more of that compassion for others, no matter who they are. And to always remember, I think it's really important for our grandparents to know that, that the family that was lost is never forgotten. Um, so that they remember that this happened and let's do what we can to make sure it doesn't happen again. And we, and thank you for raising that. We did one of those studies, which when we, uh, we actually surveyed college students who had Holocaust study, um, Holocaust education in high school. And, you know, it was clear that those students who have Holocaust education are more open. They are more um, apt to stand up against intolerance. They are open to different perspectives. Um, and particularly those who engage with Holocaust survivor testimony are even more so. So we know how important this is. So, you know, thank you for raising that. Who else wants to take in this one last um, uh, comment that they want to make sure people hear? Emily? All right, Emily and then Lisa. Just quickly, I think um, that the water is warm. Anybody who feels like they have uh, a story, whether it's a Holocaust memory story or any other story, all of us come from people um, who experience something that needs to be retold. And it's the way that we connect with each other around the world by sharing these stories of ancestry. Um, and I think that if we can all break bread, as Carolyn said, get a coffee with somebody, learn something about someone, um, that we'll be living in communities with each other better and that there's value in a really personal familial way and also in a global way when we spend time talking about the past. Okay. Lisa. I would say that my last message would be to be proud of who you are and where you come from. And within that note, as third generation survivors of genocide, to always be an active voice against injustice perpetrated against any marginalized group because we were there and we can never stand idly by. All right, Jeremy. Um, and I live my life this way thanks to my grandfather who is still alive, he's 97. He'll watch the recording when I go down to Florida because he still hasn't learned how to use a lot of this yet. So God willing, he'll watch this. Um, and it's to say that they, our relatives, our grandparents and others, they fought so that we could live and so that we could continue to do and live Jewish and lives of meaning. And so it's, um, it's a privilege that we have to do that. And the more that we can teach that to our kids and to others, I think that's where the meaning comes. We're not supposed to be Jewish, I think, uh, because the Holocaust happened. I think the pride for a lot of us who are Jewish and our grandparents who went through it is that we have the chance now to live the lives that they wish they had had a chance to live, uh, the world that they came from. And uh, we now get a chance to do that. And let's be proud to do that. And let's make sure that others get a chance to do that, both who are Jewish and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Ira? Yeah, I'll just add, um, you know, my, my great uncle said in his show, uh, um, a recording that, you know, when he was growing up, things were, were good and, you know, they had, um, everything that they needed and it was a sophisticated time and it was not something that they could ever imagine happening. And I think as we look around today, uh, I certainly think I'm very blessed and we all live a blessed life and it's hard to imagine such atroc atrocities ever happening again. And I think the message is to um, continue to educate and also uh, sleep with one eye open almost because we need to be prepared um, for something, God forbid, ever happening like this. And, and I just want to applaud um, all the panelists today and Corey and Carolyn, you guys, I mean, we're, we're, we're sending the message about educating and speaking and and we're doing it right now so you know all i feel like my grandmother my grand uncle would be very proud of all of us today so congratulations 
Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, thank you for that. And, and thank all of you for uh, the participation. So we've got a couple of questions coming in. And one that I'd like to start with is, um, is really about, we, we were talking about a lot about the resilience, but there's also trauma. This is one of the, mo- the darkest periods of our history, the, you know, when um, this kind of hatred went unchecked, um, you know, as, as we hear about the, the, the challenges and the, the deeply traumatic events, we know that there's intergenerational trauma, and this is particularly um, talked about often by the second generation. Um, I had the, the great pleasure of uh, interviewing Robert Crowell, who's done some amazing work from a psychological perspective on second um, and third generation intergenerational trauma and hope. Um, um, do you think that there's something to this that there's, it's more possible for the third generation, perhaps, to, to speak up, to carry these stories than it was for the second generation? I'd love to speak to that, please, if I may. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can tell you for certain that my, my parents, uh, my mother, excuse me, my mother and my two aunts, uh, they always spoke about it, but I think that they had to live in the home and the repercussions of the pain and suffering that my both my grandparents went through. Mm-hmm. And to some regard, I think they felt they knew all the stories, they told all the stories, but they never delved deeper. Our generation, mm-hmm. uh, my generation wants to know more. We want to know more than just what happened. We want to know what the world was like before. We want to know who their parents were. And now with the world of Ancestry.com and DNA, we want to know where we came from and who we are well beyond that. And that's been a part of my own personal journey and my whole family's journey. And now I'm delving into my grandmother's story, Ursula LeBron, a blessed memory. She survived the Shoah, but she never talked about it. We know very little. But now by delving into it, I'm now learning her story and I want to pass on her story. She felt she couldn't. And my parents, my mother didn't really learn it either. So, yeah, I think we have a role in telling the story of those who either couldn't or didn't in a way that we um, they, they wouldn't or couldn't. Mm-hmm. Anyone else have a, a, a perspective on this? I saw you nodding, Lisa, yeah. Yeah, um, I think with second generation, there was also the issue of more to assimilate to American culture in, in such a rapid pace that sort of hanging on to the language and culture of pre-war Europe was something that was not necessarily prioritized in the home. And I think along that same note, stories of the war, when at least in the in my grandparents' home, were not really spoken about. There was an understanding, there was an, an awareness that they were survivors, but for my mom and for my aunt and my uncle, there was a sense of needing to assimilate and trying to put that otherness beside them because my grandparents came here with such sort of um, a tremendous sense of newness that it was a challenge for them to try to progress and establish themselves in America. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to weigh in on this one? Is it easier for the third generation? I'll I'll jump in. Um, You know, I think It's interesting. I had a conversation with the LA Holocaust Museum, who's a sponsor of of today's program. And um, one of the, you know, the the folks over there said to me that she thought it was really interesting that with third generation, there's almost like enough time and space between what our grandparents experienced. And then by the time we came along. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and I certainly see it with my own mom. I think that she you know, as it's been pointed out, I think when you grow up in the home of survivors, you're surrounded by it 24 seven as where for us, you know, we, we had that distance from it. So I was able to observe and, and pick up things that my mom maybe was too close to, um, or that my grandparents didn't relate to her because they were still too close to the experience. So, you know, by the time my grandfather and I had a conversation about it, he was like 40, 50 years away from the event that happened. And so he was able to share it in a way that, um, that was different, that it was more like the storytelling piece and a little bit that there was still trauma there, but a little bit less, I think of the freshness of the trauma. That's amazing. Well, one of the, the questions we've had from the audience is, is really particularly around the, I mean, 
how the second and third generation feel about anti-Semitism as well, but also about how these stories can possibly build bridges. I mean, I know we're seeing today, I mean, I'm, you know, as we come out of the second year of a global pandemic and we're more and more siloed, we're listening to ourselves, our kind of our narratives are reflected back to us. Um, and so we're seeing that rise of tribalism, that rise of othering. And what I sometimes look at it as kind of competitive suffering, right? So you have those um, marginalized and, and other groups who are comparing their suffering to other marginalized and other groups. Um, and we get into that sort of element. And, and so, you know, issues like, you know, um, you know, Holocaust distortion or even Holocaust denial um, coming from um, an anti-Semitism coming from, you know, groups like Black Lives Matter or others. So how can these stories and how can the third generation help to build those bridges and perhaps, um, uh, you know, address, I think it was, um, Jeremy, you talked about that, you know, we're all seeing anti-Semitism differently, Holocaust distortion seen as differently, how it manifests and how it goes. What's our responsibility to, 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 um, uh, uh, to do that? What's our opportunity to maybe build those um, bridges? Um, to address that, I think one of the things that is hard is that Gen Z, as it's been researched, sees a lot of anti-racial behavior as universal and don't necessarily see things as targeted, particularly at Jews versus other groups. Certain groups have helped to try to highlight that. So I think when it comes to the Holocaust, I think it is helpful to consider how this story can show that it can happen not only to us, but to so many. Uh, and the truth is that, as we know, uh, while the Holocaust, we, we put the number at six million Jews, others were also affected greatly. So showing it as a universal genocide might also be helpful for connecting, um, especially within communities that sometimes there's some intersectionality that has happened in of recent. So we need to use that language with this new generation, um, as opposed to an older generation, which was more used to div divided by ethnicity, race, location. Goodness, I remember my grandparents did not speak Yiddish. They spoke German. Uh, you know, German Jews sometimes didn't always look so kindly on some of their other friendly, uh, you know, Jews. And there's Jewish infighting. So I think to universalize it to some degree doesn't necessarily cheapen it, but we still need to, I think there's something important about maintaining that this is part of our Jewish history. We have been there. There have been other groups too, but this is a major part of our story and let's not undermine that either. Other thoughts on this? Carolyn, if you if you think if you heard what I heard can help bridge some of these gaps, you know, create some commonality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that's so interesting about the Holocaust is that, and I speak about this in my own interview, is that this event happened to people like you and me that had lives, that had jobs, that had families. And when you think about that, no matter who you are, I think anyone universally can relate to that. You know, if you have a family and you have a career and you have a life and your life is automatically upended for no other reason than just what you believe or what you identify as, I think anyone can relate to that. Um, you know, we just had Martin Luther King Day recently and I posted something on, on Instagram um, in honor of that where, where Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, speaks about the commonality, right? The commonality of, of suffering um, between the Jewish people and, and other groups of people. And I think just all you have to do is look at history and look at, you know, suffering across history and resilience across history to see that commonality. But I think the, the crux of it is we're all people with lives and with families. And when you can think about that and think about someone else who has a life and a family, then you can identify with that. And I think that that's a very big um, way of, of sort of bridging. And I hope that if you heard what I heard can do that. Emily? Yeah, so, you know, we're obviously sidebarring here. One of the things that I, wasn't expecting when Bubby saw my story was that I think she felt a sense of relief. Um, and because there's so many people participating in this project and hopefully more will, who aren't going to be able to talk to their grandparents, what do you want them to know you feel seeing your family carry on the story? 
it makes me feel so blessed and so grateful that future generations, my children, grandchildren, and my nine great-grandchildren, I hope and pray to have more, are going to be able to listen to it and carry on Judaism and to teach about kindness, love, compassion, understanding. We're all got children. We're all created equal. And we all have the same needs. Through love and kindness and education, we could reach the goals to make it better for humanity, for all mankind. Because as I said, we're all God's children, no matter what color we are, no matter what we look like, we all have the same needs. God bless you. And thank you for inviting me to listen to me. And even though I'm 89, I plan to speak more and more churches, universities, and high schools. Thank you. God bless. And I appreciate all the wonderful things my Emily and all of you are doing. Thank you. Todaraba. Oh, thank you so much, Bobby. I couldn't think of a better way to wrap up the panel. But I, before we go, Carolyn, what's next for this project? And we had an earlier question about um, about the possibility of including 3G with special needs. You know, what's next? What's the plan? Let's let's talk a little bit about that. And then Steve Ross, I'm just giving you a little bit of heads up. I know you're 2G. I'd love love to hear you know your take on this as we wrap up this wonderful session. But Carolyn. Yeah, um, so just to address the interviewee selection process, you know, right now we're very limited on um, on resources just as far as like filming. But I mean, of course, those with special needs should absolutely feel welcome to participate in this project. It's about anyone who has a story to share, who is the grandchild of a Holocaust survivor. I want to capture your story. It doesn't matter, you know, what where you come from or any, you know, any circumstance that you're in, if you have a story to share, I want to capture it. But with that, I'll say, bear with us because we're <laughs> limited on, on resources right now, hopefully to change in the future. But um, I think as far as what's next for, if you heard what I heard, you know, there are a few goals in place. One of those right now, just being awareness, because the more awareness we can create, the more interest we can pique in Holocaust education and wanting to learn more. And hopefully, as I said, you know, it, at the start of, of our time together that maybe someone will see a clip of ours on social media or, you know, hear Jeremy speak at, you know, an event at his temple or see something that Ira and his wonderful wife, Lizzie post on social media and want to learn more and then come to the show of foundation and want to learn more or go to Holocaust museum, Los Angeles and want to learn more. So, you know, I think as far as what's next for, if you heard what I heard, I hope that we can just continue to, to grow this project and capture as many stories as possible. Um, and hopefully the resources will come as we build and build. Um, but it's, this project has been like one of the greatest honors of my life to, to capture these stories. And I'm so beyond honored that Bubby has been able to join us today, truly. And Emily um, actually, you know, called me right after Bubby watched her interview and, and said that there was this sense of relief. And Amanda Markowitz Weisenberg, who I filmed for this round, um, watched with her grandmother's best friend, Ella Mandel, who's still alive and speaks at the Museum of Tolerance often. And it was so interesting. They sent me a, a video of, you know, when Ella watched um, Amanda's interview and Ella spoke after and said a few words. And she, she echoed what Bubby said, which is, I'm so relieved. It's like, your generation has it. You guys have it. And Emily talks about this in her interview that, that we can take the baton and pass it forward and keep going. And Ira speaks about that in his interview as well, that he hopes his, his kids can, you know, take the torch and carry it forward. And that's really, you know, that's the goal for this project. I want to see that happen. I want to see the younger generations latch on to this and feel as passionately as, as we do about making sure these stories don't die out. All right. Well, thank you, Carolyn, for all that you're doing. Thank you to all of our panelists today. And Steve Ross, I want you to come back on because I think you've got a, a really interesting perspective being both a 2G, being part of this program, being a brilliant historian of some of these issues that we're talking about and being right at the heart of the fight to counter anti-Semitism. So love to hear your thoughts as we wrap up this afternoon's program. Yes, I think uh, Carolyn said something that I would totally agree with, that it is in many ways much easier for the third generation to tell these stories and to hear the stories. Uh, think of it this way, 
my generation, the baby boomers, are confronting the trauma of the Holocaust through our parents years after they experience it, whereas you 3Gs are doing decades later. And I know growing up, the worst thing growing up as a survivor, I had no grandparents, uh, they were all killed, but no one wanted to talk about it. And there's a film, it's interesting, a film in the Jewish Film Festival opening now um, about basically how survivors began talking, how and when. And I can tell you in my family, which was, uh, my father was in uh, Warsaw Ghetto and then in Dachau, my mother in Ludge, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen and Salzwedel, Germany at a munitions camp. Um, when we would have a Seder, uh, my sister and I were the ones with the accents at the table. Everyone else were survivors. And it wasn't until, it, I believe it was ABC showed the Holocaust, the miniseries, mm -hmm. that, and this was what, in the late 70s, and they said, if American network television can talk about the Holocaust, then we can begin to talk about it now. And that was the first time they and their friends would talk about it to their children. Uh, and now many decades later, when they have, remember, they didn't want to look backwards. They wanted to look forwards. They didn't want to think about what they had gone through. They wanted to think about what they, the opportunities they still had. And so um, we didn't really talk much at all. And I just have to show you, this is my mother, 97 and a half, still looking good. I, I can't quite, there you go. There's the. Mm -hmm. In Hallandale, Florida, living by herself and still telling me what to do every day. Uh, even though I left her a message telling her this was going on, my phone rang a little bit ago because she doesn't listen to the messages. She just saw her zine called her. Anyway, I want to thank Corey. I want to thank all the panelists today for sharing memories of their grandparents and particularly how those firsthand accounts of the Holocaust have shaped your advocacy, professional lives, and philanthropy. And it's our great hope that the stories that are told by the survivors, many of whom, like my parents, went on to lead fulfilling lives, as they said, Hitler's dead, we're alive, we got the last laugh. Uh, and particularly having projects like Carolyn's, uh, what I, if you knew, if you heard what I had heard, these memories should never be forgotten. So I want to thank you all again uh, on behalf of the Kasdan Foundation, the Kasdan Institute, the Shoah Foundation, and uh, the Holocaust Museum LA for participating. And I want to thank you, the audience, for joining us this afternoon. And I hope we'll see you again at other performances. It'll be for the Kasdan. It'll be all virtual this spring. And we're hoping to see some of you live in the fall. Have a good Sunday. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.